Ladies and gentlemen, most deaf. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea to show the video first, because if you came out here before, we never could have gotten to the video. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was, um, I shot that video a long time ago. I said I didn't shoot it, my uh, great artist Rico Gatson put it together um, when I was uh, uh, on Geffen Records. That was um, part of a, like a singles project that, that I had convinced them into doing that they realized that, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, <laughs> well, I was curious about, you know, obviously there's a lot of things you could have shown and a lot of things that, um, you know, you could have put in front of the audience. I was curious about why you went specifically for that tune. Well, uh, just to, to, you know, to get it airborne, I mean, it was this project that I had started in earnest with uh, this exciting visual artist Rico Gasson and I gave him the song and he did this what I think is like a really kind of spare but really engaging visual piece to it and um I wanted it to get out and it just kind of just sat <laughs> you know on the shelf at, at the label so I was like you know what um I could have uploaded it on YouTube um I'm, I'm not as technically Savvy as others, <laughs> uh, analog, still learning how to read in digital. But um, I wanted to just you know, it's a it's a public forum, um, and it's kind of like the the an, another type of debut for for the, for that video. I just want to have people have an opportunity to see it. You know, hopefully people to talk about it and, and get it out there. Well, one of the things that it seems to me the song is about is about the kind of substitution uh, publicly of a set of false issues, you know, various kinds of feuds among rappers or this or that um, in place of real issues. Yeah. And that's obviously something that um, you've talked about and something that, that um, you've wanted to really kind of correct, I think, in, in your own work. Well, you know, I mean, just to offer another type of perspective, I mean, you, you know, there's that famous chorus, so like, let each make haste to indulge his taste. I'm really not trying to, um, I just want to show the, the perspective that I have and that, that I know that other people have. It may not even be that big a group of people, which in, in a lot of instances, in more instances than not, it, it is. As a matter of fact, it's an underrepresented point of view, I feel. It's a point of view that a lot of people share, but that doesn't get the same type of airtime as other perspectives. So I'm just saying, well, hey, if you're gonna talk about that, then you, you know, you know, give some equal, equal space to this. Um, and what I was really seeing is that how these type of rap feuds and even like just celebrity feuds, like, you know, Lindsay and Britney stop talking and that type of thing. <laughs> Not your friend anymore. <laughs> um, that type of thing. But even, I mean, that's a little more lighthearted as opposed to like something that might happen between, you know, a 50 and a Ja, and uh, I was seeing how that was affecting younger people. Um, high school age folks in, in, in one sense, but even in another sense, like the fourth and fifth graders have, you know, family members that work in education and teach these, these age groups. And young people start to see that as a way of dealing with conflicts and of just moving through the world and establishing some sort of authority and control over themselves and their environment. And 
it's we got to show them a better way, you know what I'm saying? You know, you're an adult, you can do whatever you like. Um, it's your prerogative. But it does certainly doesn't hurt you or take anything away from you. It's not a huge burden to like be mindful that the world is watching, and in particular, the the young folks. You know, it don't mean you have to have a halo coming over your head, or <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But certain types of attitudes, language, imagery, are uh, do more harm than good. You know. Well, you know, I was struck. Uh, you know, earlier uh, the high school students who were here, and for those of you who weren't there. Um, Ask some questions of, of Mo's. And uh, I was really kind of struck by how good those questions were, actually, and disappointed too, because <laughs> they took some of my juice away. <laughs> but um, one of the, I, I, was, I was struck by your response. I mean, one student asked Mo's about, you know, the use of the N word. And, um, and, uh, what, Northwesterners? <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a spot on the, uh, uh, and, and I, was, I, was, I was intrigued by your answer because, you know, you talked about, you know, as a grown-up and uh, somebody coming up that the word was just around and, you know, but then you had a different response sort of as a parent. And I wonder, uh, you know, for the, for the folks who weren't there, I wonder if you wouldn't mind running through that again because I was, I was intrigued by it. Well, it's interesting because, as a, you know, as an adult, this kind of just like only responsible for yourself. You're like, you know, say whatever I want, you know, I'm grown, you know. And you start to have kids, or, or you have young people looking up to you. Uh, it's not a word that I easily imagine in the mouth of my younger children. It's not a word that I would necessarily want to hear my younger children use in a certain context. However, I do have a funny joke about. <laughs> Uh, my son telling a joke using that word. And it was really funny. And he's, you know, five, you know? <laughs> and it was, you know, it was a little cheeky and provocative, but it wasn't like, you know, we died of slaves, you can't say that word. Um, but it's I, I, So how did you handle it? I laughed, you know, to be perfectly honest. I just laughed. It was like, okay, that was funny. <laughs> you don't have to say that word so much, though. Let's, let's just put some moderation on it. Um, I don't, I, people have extreme, I, I tend to shy away from extremes of anything. People have extreme feelings about that word to w one side or the other. I respect both perspectives. I have sort of ambiguous feelings about it because I respect the, the tradition and the history of people who had a different type of experience with that word. I also respect my own experience and the experience of people who share that experience with me coming from you know, seventies, the the eighties, um, the hip hop generation. The thing that's interesting to me about that word is that it has this interesting type of pitch control on it. Is that the value in the word is based on the context and the user. And I'm not sure if there are many words in the American language like that. That's true. I think, you know, it's one of these things, I, I remember one time interviewing Eminem, and he, his, he said like he would never use it. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't know that a white person could ever really use it. Whereas like black people using it among themselves, I mean, it seems like, you know. It's, you know, the, the, in, the history of the word and speaks a lot to the history of the country and to this nation and to the, the dynamic of slavery or oppression. But it also speaks to the language of like, who owns, to, to, it also speaks to the issue of like, who owns and controls language and its meaning. Sure. And 
I think that the history of the word is still evolving. I actually think that it's a magical word, that it occupies some strange, uncomfortable, magical place in the public consciousness that people, some people have reconciled a very easy relationship with it, and some others are just like, oh, oh, you know, it makes people go you know, like, even now, people are just like, most be careful. <laughs> Uh, You're in the N-word zone. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, okay. It's like, I also feel like five years old every time I say yeah. the N-word. Right, know? it's I mean, like, what do you think it could be any of Nike? Like, you know, it's like, it could be, it could be a, lot, a lot of things. <laughs> um, well, I think one of the things they were talking about, you know, who owns what, and because the other word that, sort of came to mind uh, when you were talking about that is the B word. And of course, we're in the middle of a, you know, an election campaign where, you know, <laughs> are you women, you know, women and blacks and all of the issues of race and gender have been like out there in such a big way. I was curious to see, um, you know, as a keen observer of the culture, you know, what your, you know, what your feelings are about, uh, you know, about that, uh, the presidential race in the Democratic Party. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Fun night. Um, no, uh, it, I think it's everybody's watching this this race, the entire presidential race, because for the first time that I can remember, there's a black candidate who's from the door, in my, in my opinion, has always had the best chance of winning. People doubted it, but like, it's not like, you know, after like 59,000 primaries later. <laughs> what made you think he could win? For, I mean, back I mean, you know, I have, you know, there's a bit of like the, you know, Hollywood producer, A&R dude in me that, makes assessments on these things. I'm like, oh, look, look at this guy, it looks amazing. So the black president of 24, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people, Americans are too vain, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Americans just, he just, he appeals to the American sense of, of vanity on a level that people may not even be ready to admit, you know? They're like, damn, he, he looks like the president. You know? <laughs> Already, you know? But I <laughs> I, I have just kind of not so scientific <laughs> ways of, you know, coming up with my, my theories. I'm like, I just, you know, there's something about that guy. Um, but on an intuitive level, I could sense it. And when I saw him on the cover of Men's Vogue, this is even before he had <laughs> threw his hat in, I was like, this guy's gonna run for president and he's gonna win. And he's gonna win because he's an author and he, and he looks good. <laughs> um, well, that's just me. Uh, <laughs> um, so now you have this extraordinarily engaging, charming, very well-spoken, passionate, but somehow yet very subdued, um, above the fray type of character that politics hasn't really seen. Um, and he's black. So like, it's like the, the best looking guy for the job at this point is a black guy. I'm, I'm cool with that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't care who the best person for the job is. If it's a black guy or, you know. But I know that people do want a bit of a, they want a rock star quality about the president. W w for good, bad, better, well, that's, you know, I like John Edwards. I, he's just not the same. Yeah, as, absolutely. You know, just it's not the same. I, yeah. I, I like his policies and all of that. I like Ralph Nader. Uh, it's not, <laughs> it's just not the same though. You know what I mean? Um, well, do you think it represents uh, progress? I mean, do you, is, is that a part of it? Um, 
But you know, that's an interesting question. Have we progressed? Has the society progressed? Has the nation progressed? Like I say, in a lot of ways, no, not at all. I mean, uh, Sean Bell got murdered here in New York uh, 15 minutes ago. And you know, in less than a decade from Amadou Diallo being murdered in much the same way. So has there been a lot of progress? No, I don't think that the people in New Orleans would say there's been a lot of progress. Um, Absolutely. Um, however, I think that these types of times foster and cultivate certain types of people that emerge in spite of the, the climate to... Um, or because of the climate. Or because of the climate, in response to the climate, you know? And uh, I think that's what we're, we're seeing with with Senator Obama, you know. I think that's I think that's what we're seeing. The most interesting part of the campaign for me has been everybody else's response to him. Um, the pundits and the Repu the Republican side doesn't even really talk about him that much. Well, they're always like patting him on the head and saying how you know he's so inspiring and he's you know he gives these great speeches and. He's in the American tradition, and I'm just, I don't know, I guess my feeling is, you know, once the real election campaign gets underway, they're gonna be not so crazy about him. Yeah, I don't think they're so crazy about him, no. <laughs> um, I've been watching the Clinton response to him, which has really just been like, wow. <laughs> Bill or Hillary? Both. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> both is just kinda, you know. But I have different, you know, you you know, I'm a I have a I'm a I'm a person surprise. Um I'm like anybody else. I have a public profiler, so sometimes I'll say say things that represent just, you know, my point of view or just I'm just freely speaking, which I don't think happens enough nowadays. I'm I feeling like after nine eleven people have just been like, you know, I, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. Like people are just, but I think that now people are just starting to be like, I don't like, I don't like that either. You know, they know I thought about this, and I, I, I think, think that's people important. People have been pushed right to the edge. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> seriously. Um, but this is part of the reason why I did this is because it's so hard to to speak like this in a magazine interview, or uh, it's just kind of. I. I the, it's a very arbitrary, sort of boxed in way to communicate with people off of a glossy magazine page, kind of like, you know, in your favorite outfit looking whatever, you know, mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just kind of, you know, and then. Yes, maybe you could be the president. You know, like 50% <laughs> of what you said or less is gets printed and it's, you know, it's. You know, 10% of that is about what you had on and how you looked and you, he seemed tired. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, okay, well, let's, just, let's just get into an open forum where you, you can talk to real people, they can talk to you, you can ask questions. And I, I, th I, thought, I thought this might be a little more interesting. I wanted to ask you about growing up. I mean, since we've, uh, you know, we've got some some young people here today. I mean, what were the things about, uh, you know, your childhood that made you feel, that made you respond to music? You know, what was, what was some of the first things that you heard that, you know, that, that really excited you? And what was the transition from hearing it to thinking, you know, like, maybe I could do that? Well, music has always just been in my life. Um, the first song, my mother tells me that the, f the first song I ever remember hearing was Reasons by Earth, Wind & Fire. Um, it's a good start. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good start. <laughs> I and um, I used to try to sing it and my mother would be like, you know, just kind of. Let's put on that Earth, Wind & Fire record. Yeah. <laughs> sing the song, baby, sing it. Remember you were singing it? <laughs> he don't want to sing it now. He be doing it all the time. Um, um, so it was like that, and you know, my dad, um, 
a musician and an artist and I sang in the choir. It was just sort of like this, you know, in me. Um, and I remember my early childhood, like, you know, singing in the choir, we would go on these tours to like, you know, area churches, when we'd be in Harlem, when we'd be in Queens. We'd really be like these kids on a tour bus. And I remember like, years later being actually being on the tour of us was like i've been here before <laughs> <laughs> i'm done, sure it's a little different I've done this. it's a little <laughs> different but it's the same you know yeah, same exactly same sort of principle so yeah you get used to performing and being out in front of people well just and i really enjoy i can't explain like mm, you know there's certain songs i guess like there's reasons and then Coming up in the church, there was Oh Holy Night, which I'd always thought was just like kind of enchanting type of song. They cheesed it up for Christmas, but come on. I mean, <laughs> when you're a kid and you hear Oh Holy Night, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, And then there was hip hop, which was uh, the first hip hop song I remember hearing was uh, It's Like That. Oh. What like what did you hear when you heard that? Like what did that I, sound I, like? I I can I see exactly where I was. <laughs> I I see it. I hear it. Um, I was in the Bronx. It was 1979 or 1980. Um, I was walking with my mother and my brother, and we came to the intersection some street in the Bronx, I couldn't tell you where it was, but all I know is I just heard this sound like it was coming from on, like, above us. And it was like that type of music, like that, pam, pam, where you just look around, like, what the heck? <laughs> like, where's that coming from? And there was this little, in the middle of the block, there was this open doorway, it was middle of the day, and the sound was coming out of the doorway. It's like one of these little, you know, ghetto social clubs, pool hall joints. And we all just stood there for about a minute or two just listening to It's Like That. And I was like, wow. But you don't say it, just internally. You know, I think that's an interesting thing too about being a kid, or at least my childhood. Is, I think a lot of kids experience that. It's the conversations that they have with themselves, you know? Of course. So I was like, wow, what is that? Like, that's, <laughs> who are those people? Are they in there? Like, are they in the, are they in that door? I was like, whoa, that was, that was intense. Money is the key to it. It was just like, and you, there was nothing else that sounded like that anywhere. Um, so then that was, my first experience with hip hop. My second experience with hip hop was in Brooklyn. I was on uh, Glenwood Road in a pizza shop with my mother. <laughs> That's where you are when you're a kid. And uh, <laughs> uh, with your parents. And somebody was playing Planet Rock on the radio behind the counter. And it was just like, I remember I had ordered the pizza and it was just sitting there because I was just like, because they were, they was, they sounded like they were coming from space. Yeah. Yeah. You Planet know, and Rock, the whole like, man. you know, <laughs> and even, even the first, we know a place. It was like, <laughs> where? Where is the place? <laughs> I want to go to this place. And that was like in the same year. So hip hop was just like, it didn't occur like, you know, you go from reasons to what I was hearing in church to what was on the streets. And hip hop was just like, I really feel for the younger generation because I don't know if they really know what it's like to hear a song and to be like, oh my God. I think they do. I mean, I don't, not, not, I, I don't <laughs> want to say that. Like, uh, not a song. I'm sure that there's some. I'm sure there've yeah. been hip hop songs that make that have been made past that era. I don't want to, you know. 
But I don't, like, for my brothers, like, you know, the teenagers, yeah. 16, 17 year olds, I'm like, what do they have this new that's like, I don't know, maybe it just changes for each generation. I know that hip hop was so new and so fresh that it was just like, you know, when when KRS One came out with the Bridges Over, it was an event. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it was a community event. It was like, yo, yo. <laughs> it was news. <laughs> I, I I just may, may, may I hope it's not just me getting old, but I don't see a lot of those news type of moments in in in, in hip hop as much a, anymore. Well, one of the things, I mean, that, I mean, there's so much in what you just kind of put out, but one of the things that's sort of going on is, is you know, how people get to music and, you know, the, that sense. I mean, you don't want to be somebody who says, well, I mean, because it's great. Like on the Internet, you could find whatever, you know, quickly. Whereas, you know, I remember going searching, you know, somebody would mention a song <laughs> in an interview that I read or I heard them on the radio and I would, you know, whatever. Go yeah, right, go right, track right. it down somewhere, and it. In a sense, if I if I kind of got it right away, like now, you know, I I would feel like, well, you know, maybe I'll do that tomorrow, or, yeah. you know, it it, the the very difficulty, you know, maybe made it a little more precious. I don't know. I had that experience with jazz, like after I first somebody played me, Love Supreme when I was fourteen, and I was like. You know, 14 and 15 was interesting. Somebody played me Love Supreme, and then I I bought Band of Gypsies just because I liked the cover, and then I was like, I remember being mad. I remember being really upset when I got Band of Gypsies because I was like, how could somebody not tell me about this? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why nobody told me? I felt like somebody was, they was cheating me, or was they were trying to hide something from me. I was like, it's because he's black. Um, <laughs> but uh, I used to do that with jazz records. It just, I was a record shopper. I mean, I, I just loved music. The more and more, the older I got, the, the, the it started to play another type of role in my life. And jazz in particular because it it put, it gave me a context for a lot of the thoughts and ideas and feelings that I was having. It sounded like that. And it was just like travel, you know, it was a way to get past wherever I was at, you know, emotionally or even physically, you know. And if you grow up in the streets and you get your hands on, you know, like I did when I was 16, Bitches Brew by Miles Davis, and you just turn it on, you you like you in Flatbush, but you're not. <laughs> yeah. Some other place. So it was another, that was like my, that was how I could, that was my first was means of travel, you know. Well, you know, you are one of the people who, in the development of hip hop, you know, really sort of influenced its history. You know, introducing a lot of ideas. And, and, and although, in a funny way, hip hop always sounded like a, a kind of music with a real social context to me, even when it was just fun. You know, I think you made that aspect though much more explicit and talked about the ideas that sort of. Um, you know, underlay some of that stuff. You know, it's interesting as you say that because one, another record that I left out, and like, and you know, I guess like, you know, the, the mixtape, the sound, the soundtrack of our lives, <laughs> um, was the message. Oh, yeah. Right. And um, I remember being in fourth grade, and it was the last day of school, and it's already like a big day. And then we were like, okay, we're gonna have the last day of school party. And Jamal brought a tape in, and he's gonna play some songs. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. Go, Jamal. <laughs> and my man Jamal had the message on the tape. Man, that was really big. And it was just, 
a song that was speaking right to like where everybody was living at or around. And you know, hip hop came about as a response to being socially marginalized. A lot of the historical clubs, the rooftop, the fever, and other places like this came into being because there was no context for these people and they they couldn't go to Studio 54. And if they did, they wasn't gonna get in. So <laughs> they were like, well, we do our own thing. And somehow, to quote what I heard an art historian say about Andy Warhol, these group of people were able to take their edge and make it a center. And that is sort of the, that's one of the most intriguing and miraculous things about hip hop or any group of people or person that is able to do that is you know you could take something that's on the edge and make people come to it as opposed to you know that, that was astonishing i mean i i mean because i remember you know hearing some of the early stuff and, and uh, particularly hearing the message and just going like this can't be real this is so good and thinking you know but like if you don't live in new york you know, right, you right. You know, like, you know, like people who are around it or here you know could get it but how is this ever going to translate and it's so wild that it's like translated in ways like not only in this country but all around the world oh my god even more so around the world i mean i think that hip-hop is more is more active and vibrant on a global scale than it is in the states you know i mean everywhere i go i was <laughs> everywhere i go they have a hip hop and R and B station in Costa Rica. <laughs> like with straight like dudes talking Spanglish and <laughs> playing Akon records and <laughs> <laughs> like there's nothing hood about this place. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's like you were saying, it's like there, you know, that sense when you were saying, like, you know, I'm in Brooklyn and I'm listening to Miles Davis, like, well, yeah, they're going somewhere too, you know. Listen yeah, to that's that true. Stuff. It's a means of travel. That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, maybe we should talk a little about acting. <laughs> you know, we've got a big movie out right now. And uh, <laughs> got so deep into music that, um, you know, it's hard to stop. Oh, so but, much fun. Um, what's the relationship? You know, I mean, there's, a, there's an element... Uh, I think, I mean, particularly in hip hop and almost in, any, in a lot of rock and roll too, you know, where you invent a character, you become right, right, that right, person. Right, right, right. And you know, I was wondering if that played into, or maybe the same impulse drives both things. Um, no, no, I see. Um, what happened with me is that I was always doing, I was always doing music. I was always writing, even if it wasn't rhymes. I wrote rhymes pretty early on. And then um, I stumbled into acting in fifth grade because I, I really hated my fifth grade teacher. I, I think I've told this story before. Um, I hate, I hated him. <laughs> I may still. It was a big transition from the fourth grade when um, you. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, think I may tape, yeah. still hate him, but <laughs> I, for, I forgive him. But he was just like, I really didn't like this dude, and he was a bad dresser. But there was that's a whole other thing. I was getting visuals in my head. Anyway, he offered me to be in this play for extra credit. And he wasn't a part of it. So I was like, not only did I get to get extra credit, I don't have to be around you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. And <laughs> I, I did it, and I really, really liked it. It was free to be you and me. What did you like about it? What was the... I don't even, I don't even know. I just did it and I was like, this is fun. I like this, this is fun. Uh, and it almost didn't have anything to do with the audience. And then the audience comes and they complete it in one way. So it's just kind of like, and it was a way to perform well in class without having to be in class. So I was like, this is all right. <laughs> and uh, 
they had a they had these magnet schools when I was going to school, like arts intensive schools. Philip Schuyler was one of them in in Brooklyn. And thank God for the people there. Um so I went to Philip Schuyler and I heard they had a drama program and I took the placement test and I got in and I started taking drama classes there along with all of my other studies and I just really liked it, you know. I liked I liked reading, so I liked the idea of being able to animate something that I have read or that other that we were reading as a group. And uh, I was like, I'm just gonna, you know, I guess it was my extracurricular activity. Like some people have sports or band, I had this. And I didn't want to play ball um, because I played way too much basketball going on. Like basketball, like when you're not even supposed to play basketball. You know, when you got to break ice up off of a ball court. (laughs) When you play basketball on like a goose or a hooded sweater, it's just too much basketball. so I, didn't, I was sick of basketball, and it was like, it seemed like it was the only extracurricular activity offered for people in my community. So, well, you can play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't wanna play basketball anymore. And I didn't wanna be a gangster. I didn't wanna be in a gang. I didn't wanna. And I had plenty of people and opportunities where I could have, you know, been pretty protected in that scenario, you know, and done well. Um, did I just say that? I did. <laughs> just Brooklyn just jumped out. Um, but I didn't want to do that. Um, so Why not? It's just, you know, there's nothing in it. I mean, the guy, the dudes in it, uh, you know, of course, they're, they're some of the coolest, smartest, freshest dudes that you'll meet, and they all end up in some just kind of like, uh, blah situation. You know, even if they don't get hurt or go to jail, they kind of just, you know, end up with the girl that they don't really like or the, the girl that really don't like them or kind of in a dead-end job or, you know, out of shape or just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it never... That it never, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you see him sure. 10 years later and you're like, oh, what's, <laughs> Dre, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And I was, I just had an intuitive sense that that wasn't where it was at, you know? And it was too much violence. It was too much, like, violence is, you know. So I was like, I'm not down with that. I'm, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> um. So acting was a way for me to just keep myself busy, keep myself doing something with my mind and my body, and not have to play basketball or <laughs> be in a game. What, what has your uh, kind of trajectory been like, sort of as an actor? I mean, just what makes a good role? Like, or not, or not even a good role that you see, but what makes a good performance, you know? Oh, man, I don't know, man. I, I you know... You, 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 as a film actor, you have very little control. I mean, because you can go to work and you give the best performance you can, but then it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to like the editors and the studio and and the the, the audience at some point, which is, you know, they they're perceiving it like from. A, a great distance, like it's not happening in real time, it's already happened, it's kind of like pre-packed, it's like boop, boop, boop. What do you think about this? Um, and it's not really you, um, it's your interpretation of this person in the situation. So with, with that being said, you know, acting on film is a risk, you know? Be, you know, you, you, you want to work with certain people. You know, people get, me, it's like, you know, Michael Caine had this, like, you know, he's like, you want to do a film? 
I'm doing a bad Michael Keane impression right now. So. <laughs> so I do films. So I say, where are you shooting? And if I want to go there, I'll do the film. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I was like, that's really cool. <laughs> But sometimes, you know, what makes a good story or why you do a picture, you hear that somebody else is doing something, uh, doing it that you like or would like to work with or a certain director or uh, a certain writer, a certain group of people, and you say, okay, I'm down. And there's a certain amount of control that you have and preparation that you can do on with the character to be like, this, 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 this. But it's also like writing music. You, you know, I can write a rhyme or write a piece of music at home, but then when I get into the studio, even what I've written takes on another type of... With me, I don't like to have all of the questions totally answered. I like to leave some room for what can happen or what I can discover, as opposed to like, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm very ready. I'm, I'm totally prepared. And, you know, um, because even those people have to make adjustments. You know, because it's like, oh well, I didn't. You know, I didn't consider this. Or now that you're doing it, as opposed to thinking about it, and you're actually in it, the application is different. Because what makes a good performance, I think, is some. To answer that question is like when you can look at a, a a character and be engaged in a story. Um, and you know, I, I acting is a strange, it's a mystical type of thing without sounding too high-minded about it. It's not something that anybody has a whole lot of answers about. It kind of happens on this on its own terms. Everybody's process is different. Everybody's techniques are different. I think it's trickier, though, when you're making a transition out of, um, you know, out of another art form, you know, because, you know, there's that, just that temptation of, oh, hey, there's more stuff. Yeah, but, well, you know, with me, what happened is that I never, ha like, I was acting professionally before I was doing music professionally. I was, you know, doing off-Broadway plays when I was a teenager. I was you know, a drama um, book shop rat, you know, looking for monologues to do in class and or just, you know, just finding a place to hang out and cut school and read something cool. Um, I like the way that plays were written because it was just kind of like novels without all of the, like... Description of the writing right. room and whatnot, yeah. Peter said, <laughs> then Elaine says something, then Jerry says something. <laughs> it's like, it was just very clear. So I was like, oh, this is like a book, but just better. <laughs> uh, it's, it's none of that, like, what you thought of the situation. It's just what's happening. Um, so I just was doing it before it was like, you know, an interesting thing for young black kids to be doing or young, you know, young teenagers. You know, I tell people I want to be an actor. They would just look at me and go, that's cool. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and then uh, you know I go on auditions, and in the early '90s, this when like Marlon Wayans and everybody was getting all of the work, and we were just be like, oh, they would have gave it to the Wayans again, okay? <laughs> 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 but nobody paid attention, you know, because it was like you know you you were either making it happen on a certain level, or you you know you were just like a you know a grunt like like a lot of us were. And then I started to do music, and my music career was a lot different from, at least my solo career. Like when I first started working with Rockets, I just got immediate attention of, you know, people from faraway lands. Like this is great, we love this. And then people were like, yeah, I hear he acts as well. Um, <laughs> and I, by that time, I had, you know, I had done, I had done. A good amount of work, you know, but I wasn't the type of dude to be like, I'm an actor too, you know, I can do, I can do a lot of things. <laughs> Versatile. <laughs> um, so it's just like, you know, yeah, you know, I'll keep, I'll keep working. It's something that I enjoy doing, and then as you know, as time went on, people would be like, no, really, seriously, like he's really 
He knows how to act. Yeah, yeah. he's an, he's an actor. You know, he's been trained. He's he, you know he's done theater. He's he, it's it's what he really wants to do. He's not just a music personality appearing in a theatrical piece or, or in a in a film. I, I really I enjoy acting. I want to get better at it. I take it seriously. Um, but not. I also don't want to be like one of those. Like, I've had a, I've had a lot of fun and like you know enjoyment acting. I've done some really hard work too, but that's the thing that kind of keeps me engaged. It's like wow, this is fun. This is it this comes across too. Oh, thank that, you. I hope so. Um, just one more thing before we uh, open the the floor to questions. Uh, you're you're in the studio now. Yes. Well, not now. But <laughs> well, yeah. no, that's true. Not right this <laughs> not minute. Not right this minute. But yeah, I've Broadly been in the studio speaking. over the last couple of months um, recording a new, a new project. Can you tell us anything about it? <laughs> uh, <it's laughs> I know you said you wanted to have all the it's questions. Called, it's called The Ecstatic. Um, I named it after... Um, I always wanted to... Uh, there's a novel by Victor Laval, a really amazing novelist and he's got a book by that title that I really love and uh, I always wanted to I, when I saw the name of the novel I was like that'd be great for an album too but I wanted just the title in terms of like the theme and um, ecstatics were said to be like people in the I believe it was the 17th or 18th century who whose actions couldn't be easily explained uh, some people thought they were mad, and other people thought they were uh, blessed. Blessed, right? So, I thought that sort of I identify with that in, in in some sense, or it just struck a chord with me. So, I was like, this would be a good title for an album, and uh, I'm really excited. I mean, it's, uh, Mad Lib has done some. Great production work for me. His brother, Oh No, um, Chad Hugo um, from the Neptunes. But the project has been just coming together like really, you know, seamlessly, just kind of on its own. It's, it's my first independent label record in a long while. And um, I'm really happy about it. You know, there's so much, there's such a competitive nature in art today. And I was like, well, David Grohl said something that was like really interesting. He was like, music is his own reward, you know? So it's, I, you know, I could talk about how it exists in the context, like, you know, what I'm gonna do, you know, when I come through, I'm gonna really set this thing straight. And you do that sometimes. I do it. You know, you be giving yourself that Ali talk. <laughs> but I can't sustain that, you know. At the end of it, be like, man, I'm just doing it. I like doing this, man. You know, <laughs> just like these songs. I like these sounds, these tones, these frequencies, these sonics. They make me respond in a certain way. And this is what, I'm, you know, people are hearing. And I, I don't. I certainly don't feel isolated or alone and I feel like a lot of people might or do feel feel that same way, like, you know, excited by them type of sounds, textures, ideas. So that's what I'm out to do is just, you know, show my point of view and these are it's, it's what I enjoy doing and I hope people feel feel the same as well. As opposed to like the whole like Get a most, you gotta change the game. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta save it. And I'm like, I understand the sentiment behind that type of feeling, but I don't know if I could so eat. Like, who would I be if I just absorbed that? Like, most save hip hop. Yes, right away. <laughs> Here I come to <laughs> save your culture. It's like, Do you think you'll uh, have it out this year? Yes, I want it to be spring, springtime, summertime record. So. Can we hear some of the words? Um, <laughs> do I have? <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> Mose has left the building. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm, I'm confident that he'll be back. <laughs> Maybe too confident that he'll be back. We'll entertain ourselves. All right, here we go. Actually, I, I just, it makes it look like I brought this here for this. But I was no, in the this studio. This is not planned, I can assure you. This is, yeah. uh, this is just a rough of a song that I did. Um, I just recorded last night. Um, it's dedicated to Muhammad Ali. Well, I, actually, Muhammad Ali was the inspiration for it. It's called Pretty Dancer. Uh, it's because uh, Ali, when he said um, when he won, um, when he won, uh, when he beat Liston, right, him. When he, when he beat Liston, he was saying uh, he had Sugar Ray Robinson with him. He was like, me, me and Sugar Ray are two pretty dancers. And I was like, I just thought it was really fresh for somebody who would just like beat this dude up. <laughs> <laughs> to refer to himself as a pretty dancer. I was like, that, that's even more butch. That's like, <laughs> I'm a pretty dancer. <laughs> Boop! You know? um, so anyway, uh, I don't know if they can play this in the PA somewhere, but uh, oh, yeah. Hang on. I don't know what the sound quality will be like, but let me check it out. It's hot up here. Why do you do that? <laughs> what is, why do people do that? Like, what do they expect to happen? I'm just gonna be sitting here in my drawers, like, yeah. Just settling in now. <laughs> this is the most curious habit. It's like that, and being on a cell phone is not a deterrent from having anybody talk to you anymore. <laughs> remember, remember how when cell phones came out, people would be like, <laughs> yeah. And they would like, Wait or just be like. The first time I the first time I heard somebody uh, it was actually on the hip hop station in L.A. Take a call while doing a radio interview. I thought that the whole sort of like it's well, off. Like, it's like you yeah, know. It's like, I'm on the phone with whoever I'm on the phone with, like, and a perfect stranger, somebody I've never seen before, was would walk up to me and complete two or three sentences. Hey man, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your work and so on. Like, <laughs> and somebody else, I'm like, I'm, and then if I do this, they're like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm the jerk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be like that? Oh, you just yeah. gonna continue your conversation, <laughs> Mr. Most Deaf? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, let's uh, let me uh, go investigate a little bit. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited about, about the new record. <laughs> I don't know why that was funny, but okay. No sound system to speak of? They're trying to make it work. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, see, this is genuinely unplanned. I mean, in, what? A, in a... Do what? What happened? Yeah. Oh, oh, you mean do the lyrics a cappella? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest, I don't mind doing acapella, but it, it kind of does have that kind of like, rap, come on, rap now. <laughs> you know you want to rap. <laughs> you know you can do it, you good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, please don't do that. I know you could, but. That's almost like when I've been on tour and kids be like, yo, man, let's get this cypher. Boom. I'm like, oh, but Jesus Christ. I just, I'm the no out, like, you got the beat. <laughs> Thought you was a real MC, Moes. Um, <laughs> I think only rappers have that type of pressure. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody runs up on, you know, pain is like, yo, Bust a sketch right now, what's up? <laughs> I'm saying, can, you can't bust a watercolor, Mr. Draw? And, uh, I mean, I've been handed a note here. It says five minutes to play CD. So we'll uh, all right, no worries. We'll well, kill another. I guess I could, um... Well, let's go, let's take some questions. 
I do uh, I do this freestyle for you greedy rap. Uh-huh. All right, that's all right. Okay. Fresh and I'm fresh and my fresh just get fresher. Diamonds in production glow greater than the pressure. None turn to some and the some turn to more. The more turn to many and the many turn to all. Shouting all or nothing like it's nothing at all. To not knowing what you got till it got gone. Same song, new time signature, new brand hustle with the long time arithmetic bay from the preacher man, number man, understand curve with sliders, overs and underhands, black Batman, knock it out the park, pitch, quiet fire sniper, not the one you trying to box with, block work when the block turn jobless and triple beams ain't the best means to weigh your options, smarts, get smart with your smartness, too busy surviving to argue about Darwin, darling. <laughs> Happily, your, your earlier remarks dissuaded me from doing the human beatbox thing behind you. <laughs> that was great. But um, maybe the guy who's uh, doing the CD thing is also handling the lights, but uh, we can maybe take some questions if uh, anybody's got one. Okay. Oh, all right. Down here, let's she's, go. Of course, down she's right here. Yeah. Uh, um, be, be kind, rewind. Um, and what is the message behind it? I think. Is well, the you know, I, I kind of shy away from saying what the message in the movie is because I know what it is for me. What Michelle is. What Michelle is trying to say, from my perspective, because the, the 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 film belongs to people, and whatever perspective they have on it is, I don't like to like predetermine it for people. So well, this is what the movie is about, because that's what it's about to me. It could mean something totally different to 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 someone else, something maybe more interesting than what it means to me. But with that being said, um, I think Michelle is in love with movies and he's in love with creating and what he's saying is that we live in a, not even so much about living in a day and time but everybody has the means to create their own stories um, or to be creative like creativity for me what he's saying with the film is that creativity, everyone has the ability to be creative. People doubt that in themselves and they, they, they don't act on that instinct based on kind of being intimidated, you know? So like the guys who work in the store yeah. can actually step out and be the people who uh, do Are themselves and it's, it's not, they don't have ambitions to do it it's actually a pretty bad idea. Um, but somehow, uh, people, people respond to it. Um, you know, I, I've been reading, I know I sh people say I shouldn't do it, but I mean, I'm curious and nosy. So I, I read the good and the bad reviews. Now, I mean, some people are just mean and the, you know, you kind of just don't pay any attention. Fast forward. <laughs> you're like really that was very clever very insightful review I'm going to make sure I pick up your reviews all the time um, uh, but I think the f I, I just think the, the, all of his films represent his sensibility as a person as a man like, he's not interested in sex and violence in his movies. He's interested in relationships and the things that happen between people and the circumstances around people's relationships. So I think just, you know, he's got an active imagination and he's curious about the world. So you get movies like, you know, Science of Sleep and, you know, eternal sunshine, and human nature, and, and and be kind. I think it's very much uh, a symptom of of who he he is, and I, I you know I think it's a welcome symptom. You know, I think we have the uh, I think we have the song queued up. Yeah. You outside? 
Yeah, let's go. Madlib did this. Absolutely. Flaco. Crushing, I'm crushing, my fresh just get fresher. Diamonds in production glow greater than the pressure. None turn to some and then some turn them all. The more turn to many and the many turn to all. Shouting on my nothing like it's nothing at all. To not know what you got till they got gone. Same song, new time signature, new brand hustle with the long time. I rep my dick bay from the preacher man, number man. Understand curve of sliders, overs and underhands. Black Batman, knock him out the park, pitch quiet, fire sniper, not the one you trying to box with. Block work when the block turn jobless. And triple beams ain't the best means the way your options smart. Get smart with your smartness. Too busy surviving to argue about Darwin. Darling. Huh, you see me, huh? A pretty dancer. Me, sugar, red, I leave. Pretty dancer. Shimmy, the way. Pretty steady, stepping out. Bing, swing, swing with bangers and thing, thingers. Soul glow singing all over the ring finger. Yo, yo, don't play me so close. Make me tell you something that you ain't really ready to know. Fight camp, you was in top form. Fight night, damn, you ain't breaking popcorn. Oh, man, word ball, what is ball, ultimatum. Light salt, smelling sauce, resuscitate them. I don't underrate them, son, I don't nothing rate them. All I do is pop, pop, bust the rate them. Exacerbate them, sharp, shoot, lacerate them. Steady hustle, shuffle, shuffle, fascinate them. Static nature, black imagination, activated you, unliving, elevated you, a rocket with the greatest. Static nature, black imagination, activated you, unliving, elevated you, a rocket with the greatest. It's like a dog from a football, see me, uh, a pretty dancer. Me, sugar, red, I leave, pretty dancer. Me, the way, see me, the way, pretty city, step it out. Sort of like, sort of like testing it in a club, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I, I'm just, you know, I had it in the bag. I was like, yeah, let's get some new stuff. You know, got a new album in the middle. <laughs> no, so. that's great, man. Thank the you. Thing, I, the Thank acoustics you was weird because I was checking that. it out. I was like, and I'm listening to it like I gotta turn that up. <laughs> And I had a double there. So you you were kind of in like studio mode a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. Just until until you mix it, you're always in studio mode. But I I do I'd really been enjoying working with Madlib because I think his sonic is just so. You know, yeah. I've been having a good time working with him, so I'm excited. That was great, man. Thank, thank you for uh, thank, thank you for letting thank us hear that. Uh, there was somebody who kind of leaped. <laughs> Somebody who jumped up there before when I asked about questions. Was it you? Seems like it, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, feel free to leap up now. Well, for, for everybody that couldn't, that may or may not have been able to hear, so the question was what the, the potential for uh, radical revolutionary change in, in society is and on people's ability to change things. Well, I mean, in the quote, how is Zen, um, is um, the, the, the will of the people is the only thing that's ever changed anything. It's, it's um, um, for better or worse, you know. Uh, People have a, an extraordinary power um, to change the, their circumstances and the circumstances of other people around them for, for, for better or for worse. Um, it, 
it's all about people's belief in, in, in themselves. I think what happens now is that people feel intimidated or discouraged, and then, then this kind of apath apathy sets in. You know, people go, well, I would change it, but, you know, my efforts are not enough. And uh, if you actually don't, uh, massive types of changes like that are usually at least from what I've seen in history, uh, stimulated by just a small group of very dedicated, determined people. And then everybody kind of catches up to them or catches their fire. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very hopeful, you know. I'm, I'm, I don't feel discouraged at, at all. I think, that, I think there's only one perspective of things actually being shown anyway. I think that, you know, if you depend on you know, the larger media for your views, perspective, and news that you, you're gonna get a type of very cynical, um, doomsday world view. Uh, but that's, that I don't think that, you know, they really reflect how people really f are feeling, you know? Gen and my travels and conversations and just interactions with people, people from all different backgrounds and places want good things for themselves and other people. I, I find a lot more good in people than whack in people. There's annoying <laughs> things about people like you on the phone and they like, yo, see, I'm saying, you know, I got this production company, you know. <laughs> But generally, uh, the, in, the, the, the impulses and instincts in people are, are more good than they are bad. And I think that generally, people want to help each other. They want to live up to the, to the best in themselves as opposed to what's, you know, low in them. Um, let's see, right down there. You. Um, well, I formulate an opinion. Um, it sounds like I prepared it someplace. Um, just based on what I saw in the news and the information that was offered on an intuitive level, I, I, I didn't get that sense. There's what you can know based on the facts that are offered you. And then there's something that you just have a sense of. Um, I guess I was I was speaking freely, which I do. <laughs> <laughs> not because I think that my, my opinion has more value than anyone else's, it's because you know I was not afraid. Um, so I what I have said is not it's been said before by people um with a lot more than just their intuition to, to validate what they had to say. And I got, you know, some hostile responses to it, which was really interesting to me because it, it seemed as if to have any other idea other than the one that has been offered a profit in the news of the media was some sort of blasphemy, you know? Um, and I was just saying, I'm not saying that that didn't happen. What I'm saying is that I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm, I'm highly skeptical, especially given the fact that there's, there, there was a whole dialogue going on between Afghanistan and, and the states during that time. And when Afghanistan, you know, the states was, the government was calling for, you know, you gotta give us Osama. And Afghanistan was saying, okay, but we're not just gonna give him to your government. There has to be a, a mediating country. There has to be a, a, a government to mediate this. And he, uh, from my recollection, Osama was saying, fine, if you're saying I did this, I'll come and defend myself against these charges, but I'm not just gonna surrender myself to your government. And 
these different diplomatic measures that were taken uh, around this issue were rejected by the U.S. It was like either you're going to do exactly what we say or game is off. And uh, it was just certain statements that, you know, the president was making, you know, it doesn't matter if he did it. I was like, well, what the? <laughs> really? <laughs> On the front page of the New York Times, September 17th, you know? I'm like, really? It doesn't matter if he did it or not? It's just, you know, and, you know, I, I, I live in a different America. I'm from a different America where conspiracy is real, where people have conspired to murder good people. Why would you kill Martin Luther King? Why would you shoot Malcolm X? Because he has a radical point of view. So does Rush Limbaugh. So does Ann Coulter. You know, but ain't nobody like, poison that bitch. <laughs> 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 she must be stopped. You know? I don't see people, you know, trying to smack Bill O'Reilly. You know, he could use one. In my, in, in my book, from where I'm from. So he could, boop, knock it off. Um, but yeah, it was, it's my opinion, and I'm, I'm entitled to that. People were like, most Def makes an ass of himself on Bill Maher. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't take my shirt off. That's all they want you to do. They just want you to take <laughs> your shirt off and all is forgiven. You know? uh, uh, let's go, okay? Oh, dude, quiet, please. Uh, a little louder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel, I, well, just so I can be clear, I'm not having any problems hearing the people when they give. Are, are people in the audience having a problem hearing people to answer questions? Okay, can we get. Uh, a microphone or something? Is there a spare one that we can give to people? Do we have a mic? Did somebody say? Can't take his Pass mic. Pass the mic. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, this, this, this over here, the black right here, yes. Thank you, black woman. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like that. She was like, you ain't gonna have no problem hearing me. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's the Brooklyn factor. Right. Um, um, uh, what I, certain members of the hip hop community are very self-congratulatory. What I think, my, my, uh, um, description of hip hop is like, uh, an immigrant that comes from his native country to another country. And much like the people in Ellis Island. 
and you know they go through hardship or whatever, and then they establish themselves beyond even their wildest dreams. And in the process, they start to be separated from their native ways and customs or just their native ideals and principles and they start to adopt and assimilate to the larger culture that, that they're interfacing now. Um, there's some good aspects to that and then there's some negative aspects to that. I think that hip hop has integrated itself into just popular uh, 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 American culture in a way that is dangerous at times because the rules are not the same for 50 Cent as they are for Gwen Stefani right. on, a, on a social level. Uh, so while they m both might uh, occupy pop star status, on a social level, if Gwen Stefani wasn't a pop star, she would occupy a different social status from 50 Cent, even as a pop star. You understand? So I think that these, these they're just absor absorbing and adopting the ideas of the dominant culture and of the popular culture uh, around them, not understanding that for them to do that is for them to uh, kill themselves through isolation because there's a no amount of pop culture success that is going to make any of us not be who we are where we're from or make the world see that whenever we walk in the room, wherever we walk in the room. Um, Everybody know that you ain't white? They know this. The white people know who the white people are, and the black people know who the, everybody knows who everybody is. And you, if you come from poverty in America, which a lot of the, you know, the, the, the thing that distinguishes hip hop is that it's predominantly black and predominantly male. So, there's a lot of shared experience there whether you come from the suburbs or Roosevelt Projects like myself. And the condition of your community is at risk, to say the least. So for me, my success is uh, I don't just sit back just able to fully absorb it and enjoy it all the time because I'm like, Yo, little man from around my way or little man from a circumstance like mine don't have it the same way. And he may never have it the same way. So the least I could do is let him share in my success to make him feel like he's a part of it. That the part of what's happening to me is happening to him. He can't feel that way if I have a $400,000 car. It's just harder for him. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want a $400,000 car? I don't even want to, not for me, because I don't like that type of, it's enough type of scrutiny and attention that you get just being some, oh, that's the dude from TV. It's like the dude from Planet TV, you know? Uh, and you step out of a $400,000 car, I had a, I had a, I'll tell you this story. I was staying at the St. Regis Hotel. I'm not, I listen, I'm an American like anybody. I like nice things, I like luxury items, I like shiny things. I, <laughs> I have way more than I need or can use. I'm an American. <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, it's just real. We all, we all suffer from this, to, you know, in the land of plenty, we all have too much. Um, so I'm staying at this hotel in, in San Francisco, and they have uh, like a shuttle, like a car that you can take out to take you to, you know, shopping or wherever you want to go. And it's a Bentley. It's a gray Bentley with, you know, the 
butterscotch seats, and they're like, no problem, you can use the car. And I never used this car. I used this car once, and it wasn't. I was visiting uh, a friend of mine who was staying there, and you know, this person is very successful and all of that. So it was. It made sense. I was like, okay, I'm with my friend. He's on. It's not my Bentley, you know. I'm just chilling with the dude. <laughs> now I get a chance to make it my Bentley. And I, do, I, I, I didn't even want to use it. I was like, I call a cab. They were like, no, but the car's right here. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll take the Bentley. <laughs> now, it was the most uncomfortable experience as a passenger that I've ever had because it's like, it's not my car, but you can't explain that to people that you're passing on the street in that car. <laughs> They're like, damn, you know? You know, people who were walking and wasn't thinking about nothing, they just see you passing by, and it's just like, it's a lot of energy. Mind you, I end up at this restaurant this in the Mission District <laughs> in San Francisco, <laughs> right? It's called Farmer Brands. Former Brands is a great restaurant. I get, the, the car pulls up to the corner. It's about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. It's all of these young dudes standing on the corner, like selling weed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm in the car with a white driver in this Bentley. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, oh, God. <laughs> Not because I'm scared, but it's just like, because I roll up and they're like, it's probably most. <laughs> Like a lot of that, like, okay, this is how you rolling? And I'm like, I, you know, I can't get into, look, it's not really my car, it's from the hotel, I just made a stop, just picking up some food, I and mean, it's not my car, He's, it doesn't work for me. But it was just too much. And with that being said, it's like, it's too much. I mean, in good consciousness, knowing the way that a lot of young black people live, like, for me to have a, if I'm gonna have a half a million dollar car, I got institutions in my community. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not gonna have a half a million dollar car and that building is crumbling down and shorty ain't got decent books. Or, like, it's just out of place. Or if I'm gonna have a half a million dollar car, I'm gonna make it a shuttle to take, you know, grandma and them to church. Or to, it's something else. Like for me, what I, what I need with that, it's like, how, how much do you, do you need to start, especially when like your, your community is in danger? Like it's, it's almost like being a, 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 a concentration camp survivor and surviving and then turning your back, or acting like that didn't happen to you, or you don't know what that's like. You know what it's like. You know, I saw a popular rapper on a talk show, and somebody said, you know, people, people just don't say no to you. He was like, yeah, you know, he made a joke. He was like, yeah, you know, when I call, it's kind of like the mob, you know, I make you off the camera, and fuse the studio audience laugh, ha, 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 ha. He was like, no, really, but you, you never really went through that type of rejection. And then it was a pause. And you could hear a pin drop because everybody was waiting for what his response would be. He looked to the left, and then he said, nah. And I was, I got so mad. I got so angry, it was like, what do you mean you've never experienced rejection? You grew up in the projects. You're black in America. Like, you have an intimate relationship with rejection <laughs> on all types of levels. If you, didn't have a, if you didn't have a relationship with rejection, you wouldn't even be interesting. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Part of the reason that we listen to you is because you overcame rejection. And now the people who rejected you accept you. If you were a dude who just didn't experience, who wants to be around her? No one rejects me. <laughs> and I'm starting, okay? I re I've just rejected you. Like, so you, that, who's, that's not a real circumstance. So I think that like dudes just get, part of it is the thrill of being accepted when you've been 
rejected so much. And people are like, I'm just going to stay on the acceptance side of things. But that's not a real, everybody gets rejected. Everybody. It's just, it, it just happens. So for me, as far as to answer your question, and I don't mean to be too long-winded, but the reality of my people on my intimate level and the reality of my communities and the reality of the people who come before me, is nothing else I could do but be humble. You know, Muhammad Ali is still alive, and so are so many other people, the Ruby Dees of the world, and Mumia is still alive. And, it's, and people who are not even from my racial community or my immediate New York project background, fantastic, great people all over the world doing amazing things. You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have to do what I do, but I, you know, I don't lord it over nobody. That's how you get embarrassed. You know? Seriously. Right. Moses has been really generous with his time. I'll have uh, one or two more questions. Yeah. Louder. A little louder. Um, I don't know if it was, I would necessarily even call it confidence as much as just like a, a need, like a, like an urgency, like I feel like I have, I have to say this or that I, that I should say this so I should say it in a certain way. Rhyming in particular was a, was, a, was a means of survival for me on a personal level coming from where I came from because if, if you could exhibit a skill beyond fighting, you didn't have to fight so much. And it's not that I couldn't fight, but it's just like, you know, I'm a pretty easy going person. I don't mind fighting if I have to, but you know, <laughs> so just kind of like that on demand, like, let's fight. I was like, oh, can we? Can we not? We were just fighting yesterday. <laughs> um, but you can't say that to you when you're nine or ten. They be like, "What you mean? We was fighting yesterday. We fighting now." <laughs> um, so I I had to develop a certain type of confidence in the way that I communicated because I knew that it elevated my social status and where I was, was coming from. Um, and, 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 and that's really it. I don't see myself as a super overly confident type of, a blustery type of person. I'm actually a little, you know, withdrawn at times, but I don't think anybody's all of one anything anyway. You know, I think people have all types of shades to their personality. So. At times I'm very outspoken, at times I'm, I'm not very verbal at all. Sometimes I want to deal with people, sometimes I'm like, I don't want to deal with people. <laughs> One more. The left, look. Oh, oh, wait a second. This, the woman, yeah. How did I get involved in Prince Among Slaves? I got involved in Prince Among Slaves well, somebody just, a Bill Duke's company called me, and I had known of the story beforehand. So I was, you know, excited to, to be a part of it in that way. Well, I think we have to wrap it up. Uh, well, uh, Who so, was yelling out crazy? Yeah, it's all right, maybe from up top. Oh, thank you. Um, I would love, I would love to do Broadway again. I'd love to do the stage again. Um, when I'm on it again, I'm, you know, I'm sure there'll be a mass email or something. And people, <laughs> you know, just oh, one more out. from up there. There's one okay. more from this day. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 
Um, Mr. Nigga was a song that I wrote in, res in response to uh, what I was seeing with a lot of young, successful uh, black professionals working, and not just in the media industries, but you know, in a, in throughout the country and throughout the world, you know, uh, young folks, men and women, but particularly men that I was meeting that were under 30 or in their early 30s who had, who had a different paradigm about what it was to be successful and who very much were connected to where they came from and, and, they, and you know, their, their communities and backgrounds and the like. Uh, and we're doing very well, uh, we, you know, and kind of like young urban professionals, surreal. Like, but they was on a social level. The better that they did in society, the more suspect that they became. And I've even I I talked about some of my experiences, like some of the the harshest sort of discrimination and racism in my life has occurred in you know, the first class cabins and lounges of the world. Or the five star hotel establishments of the world because there's this sort of shock and awe that people have that like, what the hell? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I mean, that's really not a big deal, you know, eating in a nice restaurant, staying in a nice hotel. Um, you know, it's, it's the things that professionals do, and I've been a professional for a better part of my adult life, so I was writing about that type of experience. It's like, you know, you know, there's two different sets of rules. Um, you know, when white boys doing it well, it's success. When I start doing it well, it's suspect. I'm not the only person that's written about this sort of dynamic, you know. Uh, LL Cool J with a legal search. What the hell are you looking for? Can a young man make money anymore? Um, Funny vibe. Uh, I, 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 I drink champagne to hell with cause and never sold dope in my life. I do tours. Get that flashlight out of my face. I ain't the dog, so damn it, put away the mace. It's the kind of scrutiny that was put on successful young black people as if they achieved their success through. The only way for them to achieve success was through, you know, criminal endeavor or some sort of dubious uh, activity. So. <laughs> I think I can only take two more. People are leaving and like, I yeah. go home. Um, this person. You. This yes. I can't really see. Oh, there you go. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good. Well, I mean, it's what I say or try to say with my work or, you know, through just the way that I move through the world, is that you have to believe in self. Like, you know, uh, the circumstances are what they are. And actually, they've been a lot worse for us um, in, in times before, and we've overcome that. Um, black men should not feel discouraged or... Uh, let down in any way, as if there's they, they, they are hopeless situ. This is they're facing hopeless odds. I mean, Barack is is a great signpost for for me. You know, 
And so is Muhammad Ali, and so is Dred Scott, and so is Bob Marley, and Nat Turner, or um, uh, Ben Carson, or, or Frederick Douglass, or Harry Belafonte, or it's, it's so many. You just have to find somebody great or some great people and, and, and study them and what they did and, and the circumstances surrounding them, and study our history in this part of the world and see the amazing things that we've done, you know? I mean, in all, in all areas of endeavor, not just, you know, you know s sports and media, you know? We've, we've made contributions in, in vital areas <laughs> everywhere. So it's, it's just no need to be discouraged. It's like, what's the big deal? Just, you know, if people trying to hold you back, that, that's their problem. You know, people can't stand in the way of really determined people. The squeaky wheels gotta get oiled, you know? So you just gotta keep... Uh, She's in the been center there. To, I'm sorry. Oh. Peace. Well, you know, as with any artist, I mean, you know, most good ideas get laughed at first, you know. The most really, really good and useful ideas people are extremely hostile to. You know, when the Wright brothers came up with the airplane, there was not a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> it was like, really, word? <laughs> yeah, my check is in the mail. Um, so I think all of those types, that type of resistance is, uh, is designed to test the artist. How much do they really, how much do they believe in what they're doing? Um, and usually people who are the quote unquote remedy and have what a lot of people could use to hear or need to hear they, they are isolated in the beginning, you know. People are turning a deaf ear to them because then they, they're not like everything else that's happening out there. I think that's a positive sign. You know, I look, I look for that in people, people who are distinctive and are not fitting in quite so well because there's something in that, in that struggle, in that rigor that makes them stand out. And, uh, so just keep doing what you, just keep doing what you're doing. Like if you believe in it as passionately as it sounds like, yeah. So just don't don't stop. You know they can't ignore real talent and they can't ignore uh, determined people. Determined people with real talent do not go ignored. And it's all about being patient too. You know people are not patient anymore. You know, you will get what you deserve. You just have to just keep doing what you do and just, just do it. Everybody want like, I want, they want to be seen, they want to get on, they want to right away. You know, everybody's very result oriented, but uh, you know, it's a process, even for successful people. You know what I mean? I know a lot of super successful people, man, they're, they're more insecure now than when they started. You know, because they're like, well, what do I do now? And am, am I as good as people really say? Am I, you know? Uh, so all of it is, is a process. You just have to be patient and stick to what you're doing. I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming out. This has been a real pleasure for me. I know it's cold tonight, but thank you, Anthony. Thank you, 92nd Street Y. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to answer everybody's question, but I love y'all. Thank y'all. God bless y'all. Be peace.